Hello again. Um, welcome back to another of my series in conversation with, and I'm delighted to have with me today, Ivor Cummings, who uh, is a very busy man, but he very kindly uh, has agreed to give me uh, nearly an hour of his time. Um, and we've got a lot to discuss today. So uh, I'm not going to go too long with the preliminaries. So um, first of all, I'd like, Ivor, thank you for coming. And if you could tell people who are not aware of who you are very briefly, uh, your background and what your, uh, your uh, interests are. Yeah, Luke, yeah, no problem. So I'm a biochemical engineer originally. I've since done certificates in Stanford. I'm project management professional, and I've spent my whole career in complex problem solving. So around 15 years in managing large teams directly, you know, HR management, but mainly technical leadership. So large engineering teams, I coordinate on solving complex problems, all branches of science, and getting to root cause resolution as fast as possible. And to give an example, one of our major issues in, in my corporate, we had a couple of hundred million dollars lost in, in direct cash uh, from a major technical issue that took many months and around 100 plus engineers working around the world. So I'll give you an idea. That's been my thing my whole life. And around 10 years ago, I got poor blood tests and were basically around three blood tests that were really, really high. And the doctor kind of faffed them. So I grilled the doctor and I said, what are the implications of these numbers? And what are the root causes that would cause them to, to go high? Because I have five kids and I was pretty health focused, although overweight at the time. And I went to another doctor when I got no answers. And then I went to a professor of medicine I was connected to. And I was shocked when none of them could give answers on their own tests. I mean, that was incredible to me as an engineer and a technologist. Uh, so I hit the research gate and PubMed around three weeks obsessively, evenings and weekends. I was still working, obviously, uh, busy. And uh, I had it cracked. And I found out it was insulin resistance, which is the biggest disease process in the world. Probably nearly 80% of Americans over 45 are essentially diabetic insulin resistance. And I found that the solution was relatively simple. Eliminate all carbohydrates, refined carbohydrates for a period, uh, all sugars, etc., And pretty much eat meat, fish and eggs and some vegetables, non-starchy vegetables. So I hit that hard. And nine weeks later, I went back in, got the blood tests. I had lost around 30 plus pounds in the nine weeks, which I wasn't even trying to do. But I saw that when I switched to real food and eliminated all modern foods, um, the weight just began to fall off me. So I said, that's great. So I went in very confident, got the blood test suite done again. And hey, presto, it was dramatically uh, improved. All the bad metrics were right back into range. Everything was fixed. And the doctors I'd talked to were fascinated and kind of shocked. Um, so then I got into that world of health and I got sponsored by a multi-millionaire Irish uh, man who wanted to save the world from heart disease. I specialized in heart disease, diabetes. I went all over the world from Israel to East West Coast America, lecturing at you know nutritional and medical conferences. And um, then when COVID hit, I'll wrap it up now. Uh, I had so many years in such a vast network grown of doctors and epidemiologists and medical professionals. When COVID hit, many of us in that core network realized this is insane. So I began to get involved in that. And mm. anyway, the rest is history. You know, I got yeah. pretty well known for that. I got hammered and put in newspapers and per maligned, you know, the usual, tried to be cancelled. All this stuff, because I went up again, yet again, against the corporate structures. Yeah, well, that's really interesting. In fact, that kind of, I had a, a different but somewhat similar experience myself with the medical profession. Uh, I got a very poor, very, very bad chest infection, sort of borderline pneumonia. Now, my mm -hmm. doctor at the time gave me incredibly strong steroids. And then uh, I really didn't know about this, but you're supposed to come off them gradually but I was taking six steroids a day and then it crashed off to zero. And uh, I ended up with unbelievable insomnia. Um, anyway, 
um, I couldn't get out of it. Three years it took. Uh, every time I went to a doctor, I went to three different doctors. Their answer was to give me antidepressants. Okay. Oh, and that, then one of them that's the way. gave me uh, an antipsychotic, which I took once, which turned me into a vegetable. And then I said, right, I'm not doing this anymore. I've had enough. So I went down the road of looking into alternative methods of dealing with insomnia. And, and in the end, uh, you know, a mixture of things like doing yoga and then, you know, this sort of sleep hygiene regime uh, where, you know, mm. you don't watch TV too late. And then really what really made the difference was herbs. I started off with a very strong uh, concoction, which was a, a Californian poppy, which, which is not the same as the opium, but somewhat related. And then I moved down to valerian and I moved down to using just chamomile tea. So now I sleep mm. properly. I, yeah, I just take chamomile tea before I go to bed and I'm usually I'm fine. But every doctor I went to, they didn't have any answers. It was either give me Solnard, uh, which is addictive, I think, or here, have some antidepressants. And I just thought, this is yeah. not this is not good medical care. This is not solving a problem. Nah, I... Trying to take a hammer to a walnut, you know, and... Uh, yeah, really, I ended up solving the problem myself, but it did take me a, a very long time to get well, during which time I, I had to give up my, I pretty much gave up writing, because, uh, you know, I've done a few books, but I did nothing virtually during that. Certainly the first two years is nothing, because my brain was absolutely putrefied. I couldn't, mm. I couldn't write articles, I couldn't write another mm. book. I, I was just in, barely managing to keep it together, because I was just... On some occasions, you getting know, half an hour's yeah. sleep a day. So I was you just know, in bits, absolutely in bits, you know. You know, a huge irony, Luke. If somehow magically at that time when you were experiencing trouble, uh, all the food in the world disappeared and all you had was eggs, meat, and real human evolutionary foods, uh, you would have found yourself moving to a very different place very quickly uh, within a week or two. And I know herbs and all can help, but they're all compensating for underlying problems with the toxins we're putting in our mouths, mostly. Not always, but uh, mostly. I'm very um, into the idea of, of growing food. In fact, I mean, I did try and do a bit of that. But obviously, when you're already in a position where you're completely exhausted uh, and you've got a sort of a yeah. fatigue situation, actually going out and minding the vegetables because there's nothing better than your own fresh organic vegetables. You you know you've harvested them while they're fresh and eat them the same day. It's the best possible thing. I mean, mm. you all know yourself that you know uh, over time in the shop the vitamin content etc. It, it degrades, doesn't it? You know, if you buy something that's been in yeah. the shop for three weeks instead of you know you just picked it from your own garden. But it's yeah. sort of one of those but, things when you're in a bad place and you, you've no energy. It you know it's the easiest option really is just to go for the, the pre-packaged whatever, you know, which is the opposite of what you really should do. But when you're, mm. I mean, that's the whole problem with people are so time poor that they end up going to the petrol station and whatever they buy, you know, this crap. Uh, they know, We all know that actually that's not good for us. I think virtually everybody knows that, but you know, uh, yeah. if you've got children, a busy job, all this list of stuff to do it is a temptation and of course the advertising is reinforcing that all of the time oh you 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 don't have time to cook but hey we've got this processed dinner that's it's tasty and it's nutritious and it's great and but it's all a lie really it's full of salt full of sugar all kinds of nasty stuff uh to mm -hmm. save you time but it, well i suppose over over your lifetime it's actually shaving years off of your your lifespan probably if you, you spent 50 years eating this crap it's probably going to shorten it, your life i'd imagine oh absolutely no that's that's uh, but the worst thing is health span it makes the last 10 or 20 years kind of really dog shit and it you know lifespan sure it shortens it for huge amounts of people but the health span is the real problem instead of ending up in your 80s and dying of you know in your sleep of a heart attack but right up to the day before you were walking around and maybe playing golf, uh, it's all messed up. We can see in the modern population, people in their 60s, 70s and 80s in an absolute mess. And that's because the human physiology can't handle 
many, many, many decades of, of eating stuff that's essentially toxic. But it's very simple, Luke. The devil's triad, I always say, sugar, refined carbs, refined grains, uh, and seed oils, vegetable oils that they call them, but they're seed oils, chemical concoctions. Uh, that's the devil's triad, and that's in most processed food, most of the calories. So to keep it simple, how do you cut out the devil's triad? You cut out the ultra-processed foods. And to keep it simple, you can easily buy eggs and make an omelet in a few minutes. It's easy. Yeah. It's nearly as easy as packaged food. You can also buy packaged pre-made dinners like meat, potato, and vegetables. And if you check the ingredients and they're just, you know, these silver trays, mm. they're packaged food, but there's nothing in them but real food. So that's quite available. And you can buy a steak and you can cook it in two, three minutes and eat it. So it is, it is actually, people don't realize how easy it is to eat real food. You know, we think that these things are more convenient. But what we're really doing, I think, is we know they're more tasty. We're addicted to processed food with all of its additions. So we go for convenience, but we're also going for what our brain looks at and wants to eat. It's nicer. Like, what's nicer than a pizza? Pizza at night with a beer. Wow. Yeah. That's the problem. Yeah. And it's not good for you. And you know what? I think a lot of these, uh, these things are... Um, there's obviously an, an economic agenda of selling things. Um, but I think beyond that sort of just trying to sell you stuff, there is um, a sort of general agenda to sort of steer most of the population towards bad decision-making. Uh, you'd see it in food, you see it in other areas of life. Um, certainly uh, the way we are approach to medicine is supposed to be now just go and get some pills and you, if you look through different areas of life if you look at what uh the ultra wealthy the important people in the world do and what their businesses are telling us to do there's somewhat of a contradiction i'd imagine people like bill gates probably eats an organic diet probably eats sort of nice steaks but you know they'd encourage us to, to eat sort of uh this fake meat or uh, you know that if you you know if you're if you're ill, just go and get some some pills. Uh, you know, uh, then now I've seen this thing recently. We're suggesting that uh, people who exercise frequently are somehow uh, sort of uh, right wing conspiracists. <laughs> so, I mean, how could that make any sense whatsoever? Yeah. Trying to be healthy and look after your own self, and and the same with mental health as well, rather than sort of sort of taking your own responsibility for your mental health and, and actually trying to, uh, you know, either sort of look in with yourself, get some therapy, do sort of uh, things like yoga and meditation, which are, help you to sort of ground yourself and be calm. It's like, oh, you know, uh, uh, you, you, you just need to take a load of antidepressants perhaps and that'll solve all your problems. That, they present these magic bullets to us, the general public, which of course cost money as well, and they make a lot of money mm -hmm. from this, but they don't actually work. And I, I just see from my knowledge of people I've met who are sort of very wealthy or in positions of power and what I've seen reported about them, what they recommend to us and what they do themselves are two very different things. Mm. Of course, it's just business. So there's no real conspiracy theory uh, at all there. Uh, it's a confluence of interests. So the medical business is a business. So it's hawking all of its stuff that's ineffective and junky. But, you know, that's the business. And then the food industry has to give the addictive uh, kinds of foods, ultra processed foods. They have long shelf life. They're internationally shippable. That's what the business is built on. The junk, real food is perishable. And pharmaceutical industry makes massive trillions or billions, any hundreds of billions out of all the diseases from the processed food. So the food industry and the pharma industry are almost like buddies indirectly. Mm -hmm. And then you got regulatory capture of the FDA, which is just a running joke for decades. You know, the head of the FDA becomes a senior person in Pfizer or the senior person in Pfizer or Goldman Sachs or whatever becomes the head of the FDA. 
So it's just in our face, confluence of interests. And they're all just making out like bandits. And the funny thing is, Luke, you accuse people of conspiracy theory when you question powerful corporations and organizations. And no one stops to think that for all of human evolution, humans mistrusted rightly for survival powerful figures above them that were gaming their life for all of hum human history. And now they've somehow managed to convince humans to distrust the people who are distrusting the powerful institutions. Yeah. Like, like you a, couldn't make it up. It was and that's blower. why all the slurs of yeah. right wing, the slurs of racist, transphobe, mm. uh, uh, anti-V, yeah. all of these slurs are just part of the business of restructuring the world into a form of profitable ant farm. There's no real mystery. Yeah, at I, all. I think we are. I think my opinion is that the sort of bosses of the world would regard the sort of, um, you know, post Renaissance sort of uh, period of educating the public as somewhat of a mistake. And I think they're <laughs> trying to push us towards neo serfdom. Uh, reduce our education level, re increase our dependence on on them and their businesses, and encourage us not to think for ourselves. Um, and I think this is playing in more and more as we enter into a more of a technological age. I was just reading yesterday about in China, there's a new service robot being introduced, supposedly to help elderly people. So, I mean, that sounds very benign, wonderful, great. Some poor old lady that's having trouble in her house, the robot will go and make the tea and bring the tea over to her and she doesn't have to use a Zimmer frame to, to do it. That's, that sounds great. But the reality of this is uh, they will start replacing the pleb jobs with the robots and everyone will be on the dole or most people. They're going to do this with truck driving. I noticed in my local super value, there used to be two automatic tills uh, and two at the other end. So at the sort of big entrance, they have now doubled that and removed two of the human tills. So, I mean, just give it time. You know, it will go into a shop. They'll be, you'd be lucky if there's one till. There'll probably be a, a robot uh, that, that serves you. Uh, and it, it, not only is it sort of um, getting rid of people's jobs, it, it removes the human experience, doesn't it? The interaction, you know. You're not oh, going to yeah. say, it's oh, deep. look, it's, it's a deep. lovely day today to the robot, are you? Or go, you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> well, pull its batteries out, maybe. We'll, we'll have all the sabotage from people who want the real world back. Uh, but, like, there's a lot of normal commercial forces there. As the technology develops... Yeah. Uh, businesses will want to go to lower cost and lower labor. So there's all normal, understandable, course, yeah. like the industrial revolution. And also a lot of bad people. And, you know, we have all the organizations, the WEF and the UN and the WHO, which made our lives hell for years there recently. Um, yeah, they love this because technology is naturally moving towards what they also want. And ultimately, universal basic income. You see that coming up in the last few years. Yeah. They want, the billionaires all want to give an income for nothing to the poor people, right? And it's just to move to that kind of ant farm. Give the people money. They don't have jobs. They get fat and sick, and they'll feed the money right back into the machine for drugs and crap food. And that means that the people running the world have a much easier job. Imagine the world is full of lean, strong, carnivore type humans who are critical thinkers. You haven't a hope of having any of that nice, clean, manageable system. It's a mess, right? They'll take our head off. I, I met a guy, Professor Matthias Desmet, who is the author of The Psychology of Totalitarianism, one of the best books on the COVID era. Absolutely incredible how mass formation takes over the populations when you inject a narrative into a modern, lonely population. They cling to it and it gives them a feeling of belonging to save granny and to fight the virus, right? It's classic human psychology. But when I met him there two days ago, I said, wow, Matthias, you're looking lean and strong. Are you gone carnivore or something? And he said, well, I'm on the eighth day of, of a water fast. 
And I said, there you go, right? So people who are doing fasting and eating real food, like with meats, nutrient-dense, evolutionary meats that made us human, there's no question about that in paleoanthropology, right? 99% will acknowledge it was scavenging and eating brains and organs and scavenging meat and then becoming the most successful hunters on the planet with tools and fire. That's what grew our enormous brains. That's why we're here. But, uh, you know, they, they don't want that critical thinking and understanding paleoanthropology and understanding nutrient density and shunning the processed foods and basically not having to take any medications. I mean, that's a disaster. That's a complete yeah. spatter in their work. So yeah, no conspiracy theory. They want to move everyone into the fat and sick kind Basic of territory. Moments, ultimately. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, I, I mean, and so life. would I, so yeah. would I, and this is an important point. I think for your listeners, Luke, I acknowledge, and I've had big discussions philosophical about this whole problem. And many people have raised the point, and I did several years ago, it could be argued that they're right in a way. Now, I know it's terrible and it's abominable for the future of humanity, but you could argue that going into an uncertain future with resources at some point becoming limited, and you could have revolutions and mobs you could have a bit of a messy world if it was all free and open, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, you could argue maybe it's better to get a docile kind of population and have stability. And I'm not saying I agree with that. Obviously, it's abhorrent to me. Yeah. But you could make an argument. And a lot of them up top are not like evil schemers who want to rule the world, really. They actually think it's their job to get the world manageable. They actually believe their old stuff, yeah. uh, which is just an interesting thing to keep in mind. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, there are always going to be people in the world who who are irresponsible, who act stupidly. And when you have a large mass of that type of person, I oh. could understand that thinking that wouldn't it be better. But I think you've got to think about, is it better to have a world when you have to suffer fools, but everyone has free will? Or is it better to have a world where we essentially have no real freedom and everything's dictated from the top down by this sort of horrific pyramid mm. with, with these, you know, I think that's the road to totalitarianism. And then all it means is if you have a benign dictator who loves his people or her people, that doesn't sound so bad. But who's to say that the next leader isn't going to become like Stalin or somebody or Hitler? And yeah. then straight away you, you're into absolute tyranny then. So, I mean, it's a very dangerous proposition to go down that road, mm. you know, I think. Yeah, well, the thing is, what I said really is only to, to, to get an insight into them up the top. Yeah. But of course, you're absolutely right. The reason I fight so hard on this one is it's anathema. It's abominable. Mm. It's the worst possible future. And... It's it's insane what they're doing, but but just that they believe it and you yeah. could make an argument. It's crazy because once you take away human freedom and human agency, it's over, even if it's stable and even if it avoids some future wars between East and West. That's fantastic, of course, mm. but it's over anyway, because the game is over when you have a totalitarian system. And it isn't so much the road to totalitarianism, what you described uh, when you have a fully controlled system, that's it. It's game over until there's a revolution. Yeah. Uh, and that's the problem that what they're going for, it's game over anyway. The, what's the point if you're living in a UBI kind of managed and firm system? Yeah. You've lost everything. Yeah, It's I, been lost. You're right. Now, one thing I wanted to touch on was uh, the CBDCs have been talked about for quite some time. And now I've looked and it seems they are actually beginning to roll this out, uh, hoping to have it implemented before the end of this year. When originally there were plans for 2025, it looks like that's all being brought forward. They're trying to mm. uh, look at implementing it before, before Christmas. Uh, I've seen various reports on that. Whether that's mm. scaremongering or actually going to happen, I can't be sure. But... I think, you know, the big problem is, I think, how, how do we actually go about resisting? I mean, ah. I, there's two great, 
great examples I often cite when I talk about such things would be uh, Mohandas Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. When you're fighting this oppressive system, um, obviously violence isn't really going to work. Uh, you know, we look at revolutions, you, you get rid of somebody and then you end up with probably someone even worse comes in post-revolution. Um, so that's not really the answer. Um, I Personally, I think non-compliance, uh, peaceful non-compliance is the answer. Um, I wonder what your thoughts on how we actually stop yeah. these things from happening. Well... Firstly, it's all to play for. I think it's, uh, I've lived my life for a long time on the razor's edge, uh, as I my phrase for it. And I think where it goes in the future is on the razor's edge. It's all to play for. So I don't have a negative message for people who are aware of this madness that's going on. Um, but equally, it's possible we'll ultimately lose largely or, or we'll win. So I think there's two major vectors in, in how you push back. And recently in Amsterdam, I went through this on stage at the end of the Science Summit. And also a quick one, I interviewed Professor uh, Richard Werner there, who invented quantitative easing concept in 95. He's a central bank and banking expert, uh, fluent in Japanese. He, he advised the Japanese government back in the 90s through their crises. So an incredible guy. And I, I can give you the link. You can put it below uh, to my interview with Werner. So that'll tell you all you need to know about CBDCs. But in terms of reacting, I think there's two major strands. Uh, one, which is my main one, is simply awareness. So Gandhi and uh, Martin Luther King had huge numbers who were supporting them. And they still had challenges. And Martin Luther, like JFK, got whacked. So there is that too, less in the modern world. But the thing is, they had numbers. So we need awareness that people simply are aware of the basic reality uh, of what's happening and where the world's going. And they understand CBDCs and what COVID was about. And they understand, you know, all of the mass medication stuff and the ID cards that are coming, ID 2020. And they just understand that that's not a conspiracy theory. That's just the way the world is going from, and it's being run from the top from the UN, WEF and all the foundations and NGOs. Just people to understand that and begin to push back in their own way in large numbers. So awareness is everything and we have headwinds because of censorship. Because of course the system knows that if people get aware and are talking about this, there's a major problem in implementing it. So that's why we see censorship everywhere. So that's awareness. And my advice on that to the people in Amsterdam and elsewhere is if you tell people passionately how the guys up top are doing this and you talk like that, you will convert no one. No one will listen to you. They'll just say, oh, conspiracy theorist. So you raise an eyebrow and you say, I saw in the Telegraph recently that, you know, this foundation is funding whatever. Uh, and you refer to published articles and there are many. And you refer to Rockefeller Foundation archives, which are all documented. And you refer calmly and you use a bit of humor and cynicism yeah. and raise an eyebrow. I don't know if I'd like now this crowd uh, actually deciding my future, right? Would you? So you don't act like a conspiracy theorist. You don't act passionate and yeah. wild eyed. So that's the, the way you share data. You ask questions at the coffee machine or the cooler. You just ask, you know, this whole thing in COVID, yeah. it turns out now the lockdowns, yeah. it's documented in many papers uh, and even in the Telegraph, uh, they were almost had no effectiveness. Yeah, I'm, I like, think so. Why uh, were they driven? I, I yeah. So you talk calmly. Be. Now, that's awareness. The second thing, and I'll quickly finish with this. The second thing is to move the opposite way that they want to go. And I think, like you say, it's kind of uh, peaceful non-compliance and also creating local community. And when you got all the machines in your local store, well, can you find a way to find real people locally, like farmers or markets, where yeah. you can give cash and use cash more and more, as much as possible, and pay people directly who make food? And every other way, try and integrate in your local community or region and buy goods and services from people. Yeah. Uh, and try and not use the system, especially given the way they want it to go. Yeah, so I, I think uh, awareness, stuff. getting awareness out in the effective ways that I touched on. 
and also peaceful non-compliance and moving the opposite direction they want to go. Those two together, I'm not sure there's a lot more we can do than those. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think I'm very big on supporting local businesses. Like um, I went into a bookshop in Tralee, which is a, a family owned one. And I was thinking, oh, it's a bit expensive. Maybe I'll buy it on Amazon. I walked out and then I thought about it. I turned around, walked back in and bought it. And I thought, look, it okay, this has maybe cost me three, four euro more than I would have paid on Amazon. But, you know, this is a family run mm -hmm. business. And I thought, I want to support them. I don't want them to go out of business. If everybody decided to go home and save a fiver or whatever, they'd go out, they'd have to shut their doors. And that's what uh they obviously are, are, you know, these mega corporations, that's what they're gunning for. If they could eliminate yeah. small business and local communities, they'd be absolutely delighted, not because they're particularly evil, but because their, their uh, uh, kind of mode of operation is to, to, to maximize profit. And uh, they don't have any other concerns other than their shareholders, a dividend and maximum profits. So they don't really care what they do. They have, there is no morality yeah. in these kind of businesses. So ultimately you're, well, you're absolutely right. We need, to, we need to make these decisions, even if it costs slightly more, it will it will yeah. transform society if we uh, if we if we take our money away because ultimately that is the power we have is as a consumer the money we spend is huge power if we choose to go somewhere else with it. Yeah, and the boycotts we saw in America recently against the the mm. insane nonsense that we've been uh, like inundated with since COVID rolled over we have climate and trans it's a non-stop torrent of utter nonsense yeah. uh, but you saw the boycotts in America and it, it can be very effective yeah. uh, the other thing is that the, there's a movie a documentary maybe it's available free now called The Corporation and it's brilliant they go through a checklist for psychopathy the and they make the point up front that mm. The corporations grew in the early 1900s uh, with new laws because it was put into place and there was skullduggery in there, of course. It was put into place that a corporation is entitled to be an individual and have the rights of an individual. And that set up the system of the corporates. So what this group said was, well, if it's an individual and it has all the rights of an individual, let's test it against the test for psychopathy which is for an individual human. And they tested it. And the whole movie goes through the checklist for psychopathy, uh, like uh, zero empathy, uh, ultra focused on one's own, blah, blah, blah. And by the end of the movie, they've ticked every box. So the corporation is not full of psychopaths, though generally people who move to the top are much more likely to be psychopathic or sociopathic. Uh, but the organization ends up acting as an individual, as a psychopath. And yeah. the classic wall free fascinating. I think uh, it's a brilliant I, I movie. I'll try and find the link if you find a link. Anyway, it looks like I give you the time. link. So um, I'm afraid I'm only limited um, to 40 minutes. So we're going to have to bring it to a close. But it's been fascinating talking to you. And uh, thank you so much for coming on. And uh, I'm, sh you know, that's been a great interview. It was really, really enjoyable to talk to you. Thanks a million. Thanks a million, Luke. And uh, always love to talk about this stuff and try and help get the message out. And also, I love Dingle. Big Kerry person. All my family from there spent many summers in Tralee and Dingle. So great stuff. Thanks a million. Take care. Bye, Bye now. Bye.